This podcast may contain adult themes. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The views and opinions in this podcast are expressly our own. When I get to the workplace, I like to fuck shit up. Honestly, every time I try to do something fun or exciting, you make it not that way. Hey, are you tired of toxic workplaces and the negativity that comes with them? We hear you and we're here to shake things up. Welcome to Let's Break Up Toxic Workplace Stories, the podcast that's all about breaking up with workplace toxicity. I'm Nicola and I'm here with my co-host Gina. Together, we're going to explore real life experiences of workplace toxicity and offer a sense of encouragement and unity. That's right. We're tackling the tough topic of negativity in the workplace. So join us each week as we explore the various forms of toxicity in the workplace. We'll be interviewing guests to share their experiences and offer practical solutions for dealing with workplace toxicity. Let's Break Up is quickly becoming the go-to source for anyone looking to share and then ditch the drama and help you break up with those toxic workplaces. Thanks for tuning in and don't forget to like, subscribe, and tell all your friends. In this week's episode... So in today's episode, we have got a, almost like a, I want to say a part tour. So we had Cardsy B, who was our kind of Devil Wears Prada New York. And she now we've got- more like Sex in the City. Yeah, Sex in the City. Oh, that's actually a really good point. Sex in the City. And now we've got Devil Wears Prada, the UK. Um, and I'm really curious to hear how- you know, the fashion industry in UK was equally as toxic as it was apparently in America too. Well, Cardsy and I agreed. It's probably the most toxic industry to be in, in a big city, you know, because it's very, you know, demand, supply and demand, and just everything being based on appearances. It's, it's very cutthroat. Like, you have to fit the look of the brand, even if you're just like a designer. Um, She talked about holding her seat, which some people- That's a valid point. Yeah, because it's like, even though they were being treated like shit, like an unspoken dress code or whatever, people would put up with it because that was like what you were supposed to do. Um, It'll be interesting to see how Thalia, like what her journey was like because she wasn't a designer she was more like an assistant or something we'll We'll learn more about the specific but I but hers was more in the modeling end of things she was at a modeling agency so it'll be interesting to hear how How it's different but also the same as being on the other end of the fashion industry and being a designer or garment maker so hello Hi, hello, hi. How, How are, are you? you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good, thank you. I'm so glad we're not the only adults that wave like we're on a ship. I, know. I wave all the time. I love waving. It's why uh... <laughs> yeah, I wave at everyone. Is it your queen think... wave? Is it your British queen wave? No, it is just like a, I'm a kid in a candy store. Like, I yeah, know. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's <laughs> let's talk about you. Tell us about you, Thalia. Tell us. Give us a little background as to what you were doing right before you got into this toxic workplace and, and then give us a little overview of what the toxic workplace was, like what industry you can get as detailed or general as you feel you like. Okay, sure. So actually, so before I went to the my toxic workplace, I was actually at university. Um, so it was quite like a, a few years ago now. Um, so growing up, I never really had much ambition, never really had any goals, um, didn't really know what to do with my life, as I suppose any 18 year old wouldn't know what to do. Um, and fashion really interested me. So I kind of went to study fashion at university. Uh, I was there three years. And after university, I kind of had to get a job. Um, as you do. Um, so going to the modeling agency was my first job. But actually, you know, before that, I did have another internship that I was at, at for three months unpaid. And it was with a fashion designer and she was extremely toxic as well. Um, I've done the- a few interns with internships back way back in Manhattan with designers. And it was like so like belittling. They're like staple these swatches to a piece of paper. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm like, uh, okay, like use okay. me for something better than this. <laughs> yeah. It was like stupid. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah she, so she got, a, she got a group of us interns there under this false pretense that would learn more about fashion and more about fashion design and kind of assist her with like making of the clothes. And it did sound really fun, but it ended up being kind of like manual labor in a way where she wasn't paying us, but we turned up just to paint her new studio um, and we're painting her furniture and stuff. And she basically had us there like until seven o'clock at, at night. And if we sat around having a lunch break, she'd come in and just yell at us. being like, why are my interns not doing anything? Is she still a designer um, to this day? She, she is actually still a designer. She's like an ethical designer as well. And I was like, why can't you just hire um, a design team to come in and do this rather than a bunch of fresh faced people? Is she out famous of the now or just moderate? I, I wouldn't say she was famous famous she's more like a UK based a British based designer they think she's um you know she still dresses celebrities for the red carpet as I've seen um so that was kind of actually my first um introduction yeah. into the fashion industry and I, I guess I should have known then um the first <laughs> red flag out. yeah <laughs> so I kind of left after a couple of weeks as I was like this is not not for me, like, I'm not going to get yelled at, um, you know, for free. Well, yeah, for um, free, yeah. So then I looked for some other jobs and I got an internship at a modeling agency in London like a, a week afterwards. And I went in for the interview and then that evening they kind of called me and said, can you start tomorrow? Um, and I kind of remember it. My mum was away on holiday and she was away for a week and I was like, oh, I had this week just to kind of have the house to myself just do nothing, just lay around the house. Um, and then they called me and they're like, can you start tomorrow? I was like, okay, yeah, sure. Um, and at the time I was basically living an hour and a half door to door from their office. So I had to wake up fresh face, 6 a.m., go into work uh, for the first day. And then it kind of just went on from there, really. <laughs> okay, so what was your first red flag at the modeling agency? I'd have to say there was probably a lot of red flags um, that I didn't, I mean, I should have known then, but I think at the time it was kind of like normal for um, the fashion industry to kind of work for free, um, work from the bottom, kind of be everyone's, <laughs> and kind of, um, yeah, be everyone's little bitch. Um, so I did have to do the lunch run and there was about four four main bookers on the table and it wasn't just like an easy go to one place and get everyone's lunch it was literally like I want to go here I want this I want to go here you need to go here for me can you get this for me so I literally had to like dot my way around the area so it would take me over an hour to get lunch and after 20 minutes my boss would call being like where are you I'm starving where's my food I'm gonna eat the dog and I was like I'm, I'm doing the best I can as a joke obviously when actually yes. the dog. but um I was literally trying to do the best I could so like running around and then I'd get back and they'd be like my food's cold um you got me the wrong order and it was just like kind of started from there just like the stress um so I mean yeah red flag there I guess but that you know it was, I guess it was a normal thing just kind of doing all the lunch runs doing the tea runs um kind of running around it was only I think after I'd been there for a three months for the internship for three months I stayed on in a paid position um as a junior booker and I think okay. it's when you're there for like a few months and you kind of see the cracks between the other bookers and um there was more and more arguments were started like between my boss and the other bookers I'd like I'd get asked to leave kind of just to go out so he could have an argument with them um what so, would they um, be arguing about like so what can you thing- possibly <laughs> argue about you're booking like beautiful people to like do model shoots like what is it that you're possibly arguing about I mean I wish I knew back then um I it's one of those things where I think you're like kept out like so out of the loop kind of thing um, and you don't really know what's happening behind the scenes until you're there you're for a behind while. the scenes yeah like I'm behind the scenes behind the scenes um yeah and then after I've been there for a while and people started leaving like you kind of see where the cracks are um but at that time I kind of just wanted to I just needed a job I wanted to work um when I first arrived Uh, I probably spent two years 
um, the first two years crying in the bathroom because I was just getting yelled at as well. Um, For and what? Then obviously- what were you doing that was so wrong? Like you're just looking, you're looking at breathing. pretty people. She was breathing. <laughs> I was breathing. You know, it's just like when you work in such a fast paced and uh, stressful environment, like anything, little thing will set someone off. Um, so I would do like something and I was young. I was, you know, I was 21, 22. I was still learning. I don't really think that I had someone, there was no process in place, basically. I kind of had to go in and learn the ropes myself. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I did do something wrong, I would get yelled at. Or if something was if something was a model's fault, of course, you would still get yelled at because you're in charge of that model. Um, so, yeah, they found something to yell at me about. Um, so, yeah, probably the first two years, I was crying in the bathroom. <laughs> And I was like, oh, oh no, my god is, and, and you, you know, stayed you just yourself yeah because you kind of convince yourself this is normal um the other bookers who were there were like oh this happened to me as well like you'll get through it you'll get past it um it always happens when you're new but you'll just get used to it don't take it personally uh which is probably like my favorite quote of all time don't take it personally right um, that's that's Gina's favorite quote and I feel like I in actually, this I, instance no, I believe that still, even in your instance, it is true because they're they're reacting to something that they probably fucked up and they're just taking it out on you. So it really mm-hmm. isn't personal. Like they might be like aiming it at you, but it's probably not really about you. And maybe in that situation, you kind of when you get yelled at so often, you're kind of like, oh, maybe no, I it's a very it's a very heady concept to like mm-hmm. get to understand fully but once you really do it's like and at 21 I wouldn't expect anyone to understand that I only at 43 like I probably just started figuring it out at like 40 what that really meant yeah mm-hmm. so you wouldn't have known like you probably would have been like how could it not pot not possibly be personal they're yelling at me yeah mm-hmm. yeah of course. yeah 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 I think that it was the thing because I was so young I kind of did like it was my first job as my first proper job that I was getting paid for as well so it's kind of like I also wanted to impress them because I didn't want to get fired I didn't want to get let go and there was other people other interns would come in and then they wouldn't be asked to stay on and it was kind of like I felt like I was in a position like oh I'm obviously doing a good job they like me because they asked me to stay on so I don't want to f up in a way and I don't want to lose this position because I'm doing a good job and so I think it's also more of like a self-worth thing um definitely back then anyway I've I've got (laughs) I've sorted out all my issues since then um but I think that was it for me so you know like back in the day I was always a huge people pleaser I wanted to please people and Mm -hmm. if I didn't please please people I did take it out on myself being like, well, this is me. I fucked up. This is what I've done wrong. Mm -hmm. And so that's definitely the way I looked at it, that it was kind of punishment for me. Um, So, yeah, so I was, I was there as an intern for three months and then I stayed on and I ended up being there in total for six years. And slowly I worked my way up from like assistant to the booker, I guess I was, to a junior booker, booker and then a senior booker. And I kind of managed to, what you could not upgrade your job get a promotion but it wasn't really yes, pro- get a, a promotion, promotion. <laughs> get it wasn't upgrade. Really- well, I, I get leveled up I leveled yeah. up I, I leveled it. up in that job um it wasn't really a promotion though because people above me would leave walk out in uh, really dramatic ways and just never come back um, Wait, can you can you tell us one story that was super dramatic of someone leaving um I guess there was just like there would just be like blowouts all the time between my boss and the other bookers and they would literally just have screaming quit matches on the spot. and quit on the spot so I would say actually red flag I've probably like listed so many red flags but red flag number two was when I first started working there there was no contracts in place um, mm. And the other bookers didn't have any contra- contracts either. Um, so obviously there was no, uh, you know, there was no rule in place of how much notice you needed to give. So a lot of people did just like storm out and everything um, because they could. And there would be a booker down and be panicking. But like, what are we going to do now? Uh, so, yeah, that happened quite a few times. And then I just uh, worked my way up. And Yeah. <laughs> So when you were at like the top of your game there, were you making good money? So I was, so again, that was another thing. Um, I was making good money, I think for my age, 
probably not to live in London. I mean, as soon as I got my paycheck, I was like, oh, this is great. And then I'll just, you know, I had no uh, yeah. financial boundaries back in the day. So I would literally just go and spend it. But it was enough for me to move out of my mum's house after about a year and a half and move into central London not like central central like where Buckingham Palace is the royal family is it um <laughs> you, you moved into Buckingham t- Palace you I are wish actually I Meghan Markle yes this is what Meghan Markle actually looks like <laughs> when she takes yeah. her mask off yeah oh, I didn't I didn't know that was Prince Harry like we just you know I had no idea it was him <laughs> <laughs> You imagine um, like trying to squat at Buckingham Palace because that's essentially what you'd be doing. Oh my god. Literally. Okay, anyway. <laughs> so so um you're in so now you're not an hour and a half away anymore. That's the yeah. point of that. Okay. Yeah, that's the point of that. Sorry. Yeah, more like uh, I mean London underground, uh probably 45 minutes. Um, because that was the other thing when that's I That's not a great improvement. <laughs> It like, actually is. It's half no, your but, original. It yeah, went from a, for, an hour and a half to 45. She cut it in half. It's a good improvement. And for London, it's good because I was basically in a um, yeah. quite quite south um, in Clapham Junction, if you've heard of it, maybe not. Um, and then the modeling agency was kind of north near King's Cross. Um, mm. So, yeah, it was actually I know where King's Cross is. It's there one of go. the train stations on my Monopoly board. There you go. Um, so it was actually a big improvement. But the f- also the Pet Shop Boys have a song about King's Cross. Oh, I'm dating before, myself. Before my time. Yeah. You should pick up. You should pick up the cassette tape of the Pet Shop Boys. They're amazing. <laughs> Use your okay. pen to wind the cassette tape up. Yes. <laughs> I've got so no, many. You should stream them. They're amazing. <laughs> They're like you know, like I feel like London has so much good music that came out of there like back in the day I don't know what's going on right now I'm you know what they've now. got Harry Styles that's not shit it's not no, good either not though sh- is it <laughs> although okay so I went to London once I was probably all of seven and went to Harrods and my mind was just like oh, look at all the toys that's all I remember it was also the first time I had McDonald's because oh, wow. we didn't have Ooh, McDonald's Harrods. in South Africa yet okay Harrods is yeah it's cool. is and, and Hamleys as well is amazing for toys. Okay, well, so you're go. now you're now living in London instead of outside. Mm-hmm. You're a commute is for you cut it in half, forty five minutes, mm-hmm. and every day you go to like. What do you feel like when you're getting into the office? Are you like, oh fuck, another day of this? Okay, yeah. So actually, before I I talk about that, it was there was another red flag as well oh, uh, when I first started working it. there. So it was one of those things where it was like you were expected, you were at work at half nine and the ending hour was six o'clock. But obviously no one actually left at six o'clock, right? Even though you're just twiddling your thumbs, you couldn't get up until, you couldn't basically leave until our boss got up off the table and then left. So, and he obviously never left on time. I hate that for everyone. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of like it's six o'clock, everyone's itching to go, you've got plans, but no one's going to get up and go and you don't want to be the first one to go. But obviously, when I first started, I was like, I have to go because I've got trains to catch. And if you, yeah, if there's, if you know anything about trains in the UK, they're always, always delayed. And like the the later you leave work, the later you're going to get home. It was literally an hour and a half back home. I would eat dinner, sleep, and then have to wake up again the whole to thing then go again. back into yeah. work. It's so just it like a washing like, machine. Yep. It was literally like just constant. So it's like I needed to leave at six, and every time I kind of got up like the, the scrape of the chair and everyone would just look over I was like um I, I, I've got to go and then it's just like that look of disapproval just like okay kind of thing oh. it's just like oh my god I just feel horrendous for even like but even like, even though you, you know, were going unpaid? home yeah like, at the beginning exactly yeah and I'm like well I'm unpaid at the minute so it's like I can't be expected to say obviously when I did get paid it was a different story but I still had to kind of leave um so it actually did get better when I did move to London because it meant that I could stay that like that lo- so, that longer time that, did it get better or worse because <laughs> this boundary is like being pushed right like looking back it's yeah. like it was better because I'm you sorry what boundary I I'm not seeing yeah there was boundaries. zero boundaries yeah zero, zero boundaries, boundaries. Yeah. All yeah, I'm okay. seeing is just like a field where we could hop from one side of the field to the other <laughs> side of the field. There's no fence. And just do whatever the hell you want in between. Yeah. 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 
I mean, okay. I think, yeah, like yeah. I said, I was a people pleaser. So it's kind of like, well, if I move, then I can show that I am serious about this job. I'm going to stay later. Um, so yeah, but then the boundaries did then get pushed even more because when my boss knew that I did live closer in London, he would then call me up at all hours of the night, be like, oh, oh. I'm on my way back to Heathrow, call me a taxi or... Um, Sometimes he would leave his keys in the office. Um, so he would call, it, like, I'd need to get a taxi to come and pick my keys up to go and take them to him. So it was, was the a taxi lot of, like, ever reimbursed or was? Yeah, I mean, after a while. <laughs> um, so it was, we, I think in the end, I put the company card on um, the taxi company I used so that it wasn't coming out of my bank account. Right. But so there was a lot of that as well, kind of like, zero boundaries again and Mm -hmm. the other thing with models as well it is the 24-hour job you always have to be on call just in case like someone's wanted for a last minute shoot or a model doesn't turn up for a shoot it's literally like constant the amount of times that my weekends were taken up because I would organize uh, photo shoots for the models at the weekends for them to get pictures for their portfolio and like the models sometimes would just never turn up for the shoot so I'd have the photographer on the phone like yelling at me being like where's your damn model I'd have my boss on the phone yelling at me because they would be calling the agency being like what why why is this all fucked up and then I'd be trying to get the model on the phone because they've gone out the night before um got really drunk and not picking up like hung over in bed and they're not picking up so I'd literally like take out days of my whole entire weekend um trying to get hold of a new model trying to be like are you available to go now if the photographer likes them so it was stuff like that and I still to this day kind of like I can't keep my phone on loud anymore it's always on silent I can't even have the vibrate on because if the the phone rings or if it vibrates I kind of go back to that triggering state Mm. where I'm literally like oh my god it's my boss or someone's calling me to figure this out um and stuff like that so it's kind of like I feel like it constantly traumatized me (laughs) I'm sure it did like I'm sure it did because it's like all hell breaking loose like every every other day literally yeah like there was always just something going on and obviously during then the fashion weeks as well um you'd be required to stay in the office until like 3 4 a.m go home and then go back in again at half nine in the morning and stay there again until 3 4 a.m because I don't know why, but fashion designers or casting directors take so long to choose who they want to be in the show. So you're basically just waiting for them um, to decide. Um, So yeah, it was kind of, it was was very long days. You have to kind of do that for a whole week break. And because there, there was only, it was a small agency. It wasn't a big agency. It was a very boutique agency. It was just, I think it was maybe like seven or six years old when I first started um so we didn't really have like a big staff there so especially when people left and I moved up the ranks it was kind of like me and someone else were at the top Mm -hmm. um and then there was like two or others uh junior bookers who again were on the conveyor belt of like leaving and coming in and leaving yeah yeah Uh, so everything all the responsibilities were kind of up to us so we had to be there every day to kind of manage this agency especially my boss, he then opened an agency over in America. So he spent a lot of time over there as well. And I know earlier you said about, asked about my salary and I said it was enough at the time to live off. But when you then start getting more and more responsibilities and you're not just a model booker, you're also like a kind of like a parent for these models, like chaperoning them around and helping them get from A to B. And you're, also then a PA for your boss as well it kind yeah. of like well my salary does not reflect everything that I'm doing I'm basically five different people all at once so yeah Look, that we, we circle back to quiet good. hiring Gina yes I hate those stupid buzzwords quiet hiring quiet <laughs> quiet quitting. quiet quitting yeah can, can we trend. start a, can we start a new buzzword quiet firing that's already a thing is it how do you quiet fire someone Describes how managers fail to adequately provide coaching, support, and career development to an employee, which results in pushing the employee out of the organization. (laughs) At the very least, it tarnishes your employer's reputation as a good place to work and poisons team trust and even hurt your ability to keep customers happy when key employees exit. Um, Are they describing where we came from? (laughs) (laughs) 
Was that like an inside article about where we met? <laughs> I feel like it it really is. We just have to add like all could also could be a cult and then it would be perfect. <laughs> Can we just pause here for a second and remind people that if this podcast is something you enjoy, we would love to hear from you. You can find us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube at Let's Break Up Toxic Workplace Stories. Sharing and subscribing really helps us feel validated. Um, Okay, so Thalia, what made you leave this position finally? Yeah, what made you leave this this fantastic opportunity? Were you quiet (laughs) fired? I was not actually quite fired. They didn't want me to leave. So basically, I was there for six years. Um, I know you asked how I felt um, when I did go into work. And it was one of those things where I kind of sold my soul to the job. Um, I wasn't the person that I was when I started to how I left. I, I was always quite quirky, very awkward, very, you know, just weird but fun like I was a very fun person and when I was working there it was everyone you know the bookers are cool the models are cool and you kind of compare like my comparison probably started there but I just didn't realize it and you start comparing yourself to everyone else like to the models and what they're dressing like and to the other bookers and I basically started to replicate what they were wearing Mm. I kind of lost who I was as a person while I was there because at the same time I was you know I was a very sensitive child I was very emotional and I would cry all the time at school even if someone just looked at me I was kind of like that child I don't know why I was I just had Mm. I don't know I was very in touch with my emotions um I guess it's kind of the trend now but back in the night like 90s noughties it wasn't um So when I started working there, I was still quite emotional. And then obviously I was broken down um, to the point where nothing really kind of, I just wasn't bothered by anything anymore. Um, So I'd been there five years and people would yell at me. I'd be like, I don't care. It it kind of became like that. Like I lost passion for the job. Um, I lost respect for a lot of people who worked there. And it kind of just went on like that for a while. And then I lost myself. I started to become like a huge bitch to people. Um, <laughs> I had, you know, like how much of a huge bitch? Like, did you just like lose the shit? Like, did you just yeah, did you level you bitch. come off? Yeah. What, how did, so, yeah. What happened? Give us, I, give us your definition by an anecdotal story of how you became a huge bitch. I mean, oh, know. can we get friend references at this point? Yeah, because like bitch. your level of bitch, I have a feeling, is like nowhere near my <laughs> level of bitch. Probably not, I don't know. And so obviously, because I was yelled at as an intern, you kind of like, you know, you you then morph into the people who are you higher think than you, acceptable. right? So then yeah, exactly, because it's just normalized so much in the industry in the fashion industry, everyone's yelling at each other. And then because you're losing so much pa- um, patience, it's a very high pressured, stressful job. And if someone below you does make a mistake, you, you do just yell at them because it's just like how, you know, I, I, I talked you through this and you still messed it up. So you kind of do then take your frustrations out on them. Whereas really looking back, it's like, well, maybe it was my fault because I didn't explain it very well. Um, so it's stuff like that. It, I think it's what you said earlier about the whole don't take it personally. It's like people are yelling at someone else for their own fuck up. But they just, you know, you can't admit that to yourself and you don't really see it then. So I guess in a way I became a bitch in that way. I was a bitch when I went out, um, especially when I was drinking and partying you know just kind of just like pushing people kind of thing I mean I was never violent but if someone kind of got in my way you know when girls dance they like really get up in your space (laughs) so I just kind of like push them away and so I kind of gone like like pushing matches and stuff um I just lost so much patience especially with slow people on the street so I kind of would like move you punch people in the back of the head (laughs) <laughs> no. oh my God, no. that's how I, I imagine yeah, that's what I imagine doing to slow people because I'm really tall so I walk at pace <laughs> it's, it's so frustrating um I, I, never I always to, like, said a cattle uh, all we need in New York is a good cattle prod <laughs> move people just kind of move hurt people, people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean I think they should have on the pavement a slow lane and a fast lane if you're slow just move to the side and the, the problem there is that people it, it takes a very interesting type of person who can reflect enough 
and actually say, I am slow. Because most people <laughs> think like, oh, I'm walking so fucking fast. What the fuck these people want? And then it's like, and, and of course, tourists in New York, they're everywhere. And you're just like, oh my God, please, I have to get to work. Like you're in my way. <laughs> I've actually shouted move before. Like to oh, people. Yeah. I, yeah, I'd be definitely. like, move. <laughs> or like if way. people are standing at like the top of a stairwell to like the subway, I'll be like, that's a smart place to stand like really loud <laughs> I went I went to the movies the other night with my son and there was this group of kids sitting in front of us the movie house was fucking empty there was maybe a total of 10 people in the movie house like total Loser. and <laughs> thanks and so there was this group of kids in front of us and they were just like fucking talking the whole way through and I was like excuse me shush and the little girl <laughs> turns around she's like did that lady just tell us to shush? I'm like, yes, I did. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. I took my daughter to like the state fair or whatever. Cause now I live in like some annoying place in Florida. It's very much like the country for me, even though it's not technically a country, <laughs> like the country. Um, and I, I had to go on a ride with her cause she was just at like the height limit. And there was like these two kids and they were like, like hanging their heads out the window and the girl was saying to the little boy you're gonna die I think his name was Aaron or (laughs) Ethan or something and I was like yeah Ethan you're gonna fucking die because they were so loud and then ever since and then they were just like like I scared the shit out of them but they were really annoying I'm loving this I was not there for it and then and then to make you feel better to make you feel better the other day at the gym I was looking for 15 pound dumbbells and I found them like in the corner Nicola already knows this story and I go to pick them up and this guy comes over and he's like no 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 I'm using them and I said oh that's such a lightweight for a man and I walked away (laughs) like an American bitch is probably very different to a British bitch because you guys just go for it (laughs) But I guess, Ugh. yeah, in answer to your original question, um, I mean, for me, like how I kept, like how I was at university to how I was in the job, I, yeah, I did like bump different. up a level of um, bitch, bitch level yeah. um, for me. And I just, it kind of got to the point where I didn't like, I didn't even like myself. I didn't like the person that I had become. And obviously I didn't deal with my stress or this toxic workplace in a healthy way. I did just go out every night and escape through alcohol. I partied a lot. Um, even if I did party, if I went home, I had to have a bottle of wine with me or like a little, we call them tinnies in the UK and they're basically like gin and tonic in a tin. Um, so I'd go and buy them and it was kind of like, it was just normal for me to go home every night and have a drink to calm down, um, from the day. Um, I would just like mindlessly watch TV at the weekends, like not really do anything. I'd be hungover. And I also, emotional eating was another big thing for me as well. Um, I would just mm-hmm. eat my feelings. So I'd be eat, like ordering Domino's every weekend. And I'm like, this is going to make oh, me feel better. But obviously, <laughs> yeah, I don't, it does. But I haven't had it for ages. But it was like, it's kind of like everything I kind of did, it was for instant gratification to make me feel better in the moment. I wasn't actually solving the issues deep down. And mm. so, yeah, so I kind of went on like this for like three yeah two or three years of kind of just escaping through alcohol partying um there was some drug taking there as well and it just kind of got to the point um when I was 27 where I was just not excited to go to work I mean was I ever excited I always you know it's like the Sunday (laughs) scaries it's the Sunday scaries isn't it where after a weekend you're just not looking forward to going into the office for me it was literally every day was a scary it was literally like I really just don't want to go it was in the Monday through Sunday scaries for you exactly and even yeah because even at the weekend I still possibly have to work so yeah it kind of just got too much for me in the end and I would just go to work and I would just be super depressed groggy I would start fights with people because I just wasn't in the mood anymore and I kind of just lost the excitement for life and I think it got to the point like I had a couple of panic attacks um just during the day like kind of there was one like my anxiety got really bad like I was going to a birthday party or birthday party but yeah I know that sounds like really childish and young but it was a birthday party with a friend 
and um she kind of went into the party and like something was just holding me back and stopping me from going in and I was like I can't face these people like I had so much anxiety at the time I was like how do you know what I mean it was like I just couldn't walk in so I, I literally ran away and went home and she called me and like where have you gone I was like I, I, I just had to come home and it was stuff like that I was like this can't be normal like I used to be so sociable meeting new people but now like I cringe at the idea of meeting new people and especially when in London as well I think a lot of my friends friends they were bankers they worked in investment um hedge funds I guess I mean I don't really know mm -hmm. so they were very like professional and they would ask me what I did and I say I was a model agent and they'd be like so what do you do just give out directions all day and it was kind of like you know you kind of want to sit there and be like well no I do I do visas for people I'm a PA for my boss like I'm doing this I'm constantly on the phone like I get yelled like you know kind of give them the whole task list of what you do but you, you don't really have the effort when you're out drinking so you're just like yeah basically so it was kind of like a thing like I couldn't even feel like I could talk about my job without mm -hmm. it being you know without feeling like, embarrassed as well kind of thing it sounds like it's you just, just it sounds honestly in a word it sounds like you were demoralized yeah mm -hmm. that's a great word thank you for that because was, it's like yeah. you were getting Stupid it from manage. every angle like you were getting yeah. it at work you were overworked you weren't taking care of yourself you were drinking too mm -hmm. much you were emotional I don't know if it was binge eating but you were emotionally eating which mm -hmm. is never good because then the guilt that comes after that is like massive and mm -hmm like it just perpetuates the cycle. So it sounds like, and then like you go out, you try to talk to someone and people demean your job without yeah. meaning to, they don't know that they are, but it's mm -hmm. like, this is what's putting food on my table. This is what's putting my the yeah. dominoes in my mouth at 3 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was literally exactly what it was like so, this is what's so, fueling my alcohol yeah so don't fucking like demean my position I mean like I it would be the, the equivalent if someone said to like a finance guy oh so you move numbers around on a computer screen cool which is essentially yeah. what they do I mean <laughs> yeah exactly that yeah I think it was that I was just demoralized in a way and I wasn't really looked on as you know just as as, as oh, what's the word yeah just like as an intelligent person I think I was like also, you weren't you know, valued in any yeah I wasn't valued thank you yeah I was just not yeah. valued as well um and so I think uh, eventually the that all just got to me and I did I hit rock bottom in the end and I was like I just can't carry on like this is not what I want to be doing for the for the next 40 odd years like there's got to be more to life than this um it's gotta be more to life no okay just me then no. so what did your rock bottom look like uh I mean rock bottom like I just described it was the chi partying all the time um just kind of like going out for the sake of it in a way um a lot of my friends started seeing people um so they would always be busy and stuff so it kind of got to the point where I'd literally just be like scraping at the barrel trying to find people to go out with me because it's like I kind of have I've had to. those moments I I can feel I mean? that like I, yeah like I need to kind of blow off steam like I need to to go out um but obviously in the end it's like well yeah the barrel's empty so then obviously I just would just drown my sorrows at home by myself with a bottle of wine and uh, Netflix and just kind of just stay there it's, yeah a lot of anxiety as well just just very I, I don't want to obviously I was never self-diagnosed um self-diagnosed I was never diagnosed with obviously depression but you know when you're kind of like in that state I had like very low moments and I was like you know looking at this there has to be a light at the end of the tunnel um and I'd already had I always had this idea of going traveling um so it just be kind of k okay, became this thing it's like okay I'm gonna go and travel this is what I'm gonna do so I ended up booking a trip and then I had to give him my notice because I was so high up I was basically um encouraged to give him a notice even though everyone else just left but it wasn't just like a two month notice two week notice I had to give three months notice just because I'd been there and my boss really liked me so and I'm, ass I'm assuming contracts were somehow now in place no so the contract sorry the contracts were still never in place but like I said like yeah I lost who I was as a person but I still didn't want to piss them off because of my people pleasing but like, also, ways. I mean, there is something to be said about um you know do 
like not burning bridges with companies because you never know like where you might find other people um Mm -hmm. although some like I'm just thinking of my history like some people if I cross their paths I will not entertain it um Mm -hmm. but it's still good to leave on good terms if you are able to so yeah yeah of course and I think that was my reasoning then because it's like I know I wanted to go away traveling but at the time it was just going to be for six months and so I kind of have this idea I was going to go traveling and then I'm going to be fixed and then I'm going to come back and just like basically go back to my old life live back in London and get a job again in the fashion industry so it's like I did want to keep those connections strong and not burn any bridges like you said so I think that's why I then ended up doing it because I didn't know what was going to happen so I ended up giving my three months notice and then those three months were probably like the worst three months of the whole six years because everyone knew that I was leaving and it kind of just became like this really awkward thing like no one would really talk to me about it like it wasn't it's very hard like with modeling agencies once you're in the modeling agency as a booker you barely leave you kind of switch modeling agency to modeling agency but you don't really or you go into casting directing kind of thing you don't really remove yourself from that and go on a separate path And so I think when I was there, it was um, kind of this thing. Everyone was like, you know, I said I was going to go traveling. I'm not going to go find another job in a modeling agency. I'm going traveling. What's wrong with you? Yeah. They literally like, what's wrong with you? You're 27. Like, aren't you past that? And it was kind of like listening to, so they didn't really talk about it. They never once asked me about where I was going on my trip or, and I, these are the people like I knew for so long. I worked with them every and day. And you're spending the majority I, of your time with them. Exactly. Yeah. And, the, and also the overtime people- with them as well, because it's not just nine to five, it's like nine to 3 a.m. Yeah, exactly. Like on the weekends. And one of mm. the p- people that I did work with um, closely, I'd known, I'd known them for six years and you know, I considered them a really good friend. But then when I kind of handed no in my notice, I realized there was, yeah, it was an, it was when I realized when I'd handed in my notice, I'd realized what well, we obviously aren't friends because I felt just really betrayed in a way. We argued all the time. I kind of got, um, I felt left out of things. There would be scouting trips where you basically go to um, festivals and concerts to kind of scout for new models. And I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be invited to them, even though I was, you know, the the senior senior booker. booker. Yeah. The junior bookers would go with the other senior booker. So it's kind of like, well, how why how am I not doing these things? They're like, well, it's because you're leaving. So I was very I was started to be phased out um a lot, which was hurtful as well. Um it was just like a really awkward workplace to turn up into and that's when my my scaries um kind of yeah became the worst. It was like I really don't want to go in. I just kind of want to leave now. But you know, I kept my word. I'm a loyal person. I'm not someone who is just going to turn my back on someone like that. So it's like my loyalty kept me going in every day for three months. And yeah, you, at the end man. of those, at I the end of those three months, out. I left. <laughs> I mean, I have to admit, like, even though it was a, like a really toxic workplace and the job itself was toxic and like the people were toxic like everything the whole thing about it was toxic I I learned so much at that job and it's not like I'm sitting here wanting to bash modeling agencies and stuff like I've become a I wouldn't say a better person because I did become a better person but my growth from the person I walked through into the door at the beginning of those six years to who I left yeah to who I am now like I learned so much from that job and so I am obviously I'm thankful I'm so grateful that I had even that experience and at 21 to have that job and then to work through and be there um for so long and not get quiet fired I (laughs) hate you Thalia like why (laughs) why why do you do this to me (laughs) um I have to I'm sorry I know Um, (laughs) it landed yeah I learned so much and obviously I I now run my own business and I've taken a lot of how not to run a business from that into that's exactly what I did with one of my toxic workplaces I was like well I'm gonna do the opposite of what she was doing because she was horrible yeah yeah so exactly so yeah so I did definitely learn a lot but it was just a relief to kind of just walk out of um that door on that last day and knowing that I never had to go back even though they still did call me like a few days afterwards be like where's this where's this I'm like and oh, it was and it was on 
obviously a part of me that didn't want to pick up the phone, but because you shouldn't I was have. Still... They don't. You don't owe them anything. I know, but Zero. Been, it was six years, and I think I was just in that habit of picking up the phone to my boss and like thinking like, oh my god, I can't not pick up. I mean, even to this day, I still have nightmares um, that he's calling me, um, or that I still even work there. And I wake up in this like fit of panic, like, oh my God, like, and that's, and I quit in 2017. So it's been quite a few years. Yeah, it's been a few years since that, since I left and I still have those nightmares. So it's kind of like a habitual thing. So I was in the habit of picking up the phone. So I did. Um, But then obviously the longer I'd I'd, I'd been gone, the, you know, the 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 more infrequent it it became. But I feel, it sounds like, it, it just sounds exactly like it's PTSD you know yeah. it's like yeah Just, um yeah. wow Trauma so what is it that you do now so I run my own health and wellness blog uh, so I am a blogger um oh, nice. and I'm awesome yeah so I run that blog I've been doing that now for over two years and so I have got a nice audience as well so I'm working on building more connections with them and I'm also studying to become a health coach at the moment so I can basically help serve them on a more deeper personal level and I'm also a digital nomad as well so I'm no longer based in London or the UK I never after that first trip um, that I took after I quit that job. I did go home, but then I went straight over to South America to study, um, or study to teach English as a second language. And I was in South America for a year. And then I came back just in time for um, the pandemic. Obviously I didn't know I was coming back from the pandemic, but <laughs> I came, right, I went back course. to the UK and the um, pandemic hit. And I was with my partner at the time and I was actually supposed to go to Japan to then continue teaching English but Japan completely closed off so I couldn't go in March 2020 so instead me and my partner um, decided to build a digital agency all online obviously I don't know why I said that a digital agency so building websites and doing graphic design for people but within like and then again, talking about toxic workplaces, the hustle culture online is is real. Um, it's literally so when I started my business for the first time, I was on social media looking like for direction and everyone was like, you know, working these 18 hour days. They were working all the way through the week. There was no time for rest. They were literally saying if you hang out with your friends and they don't give you value, then that's just pointless and you're wasting your time. So then again, I was influenced in this job and then I started to become influenced with this hustle culture where I was like, well, if I just have like a day where I'm, you know, just chilling around the house and watching TV, like I am lazy. So then that was like, again, I hit more burnout because I was just working these crazy hours. And I was like, well, I thought the whole point of building a business was the freedom, right? So that you can do what you want. So- But not in the beginning. In the beginning. beginning. (laughs) Because I- Yeah, I also built my company and I was working more hours than the first year and a half, I want to say. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. many hours. It's not even a joke. Yeah. Yeah. So it became, again, yeah, very intense. And also I realized that my partner's dream of building a digital agency then wasn't my dream. Um, I'm not Mm -hmm. a very technical person. So building these websites, it, it just didn't really excite me. And so then I kind of did turn my focus um, into blogging. I started blogging about my experience uh, with starting a business and it kind of led into productivity tips while working from home because it was still the pandemic. And then it kind of expanded into self-care, how to kind of incorporate self-care into your day um, because it doesn't have to be a whole day. It could just be 10 minutes of self-care a day just to kind of give yourself that little break. And then it's kind of, yeah, morphed into more of a wellness, um, uh, health and wellness rounded blog. Long story short, it is great. And now obviously I I, I no longer get the Sunday scaries. I wake up um, every morning kind of just looking forward to what I do. Um, And I feel like I kind of have that purpose. Like a lot of the time, even though I had a job, a nine to five job, and I kind of had that, you know, like that structure, I still felt still felt very lost within my life I was like well is this what I'm going to be doing for the next 40 years or you know 
because this doesn't excite me. So I'm I'm happy that I have found something that I'm so passionate about that has kind of become my purpose. And yes, yeah, it's, it's really exciting. And I'm looking forward to where um, my brand, brand, <laughs> my blog goes. Um, yeah, I've got a lot, a lot of it in the pipeline. It has been just so delightful talking to you because it's so clear how your transition has kind of happened. You know, you had this incredibly that like awesome opportunity to work in an industry that at the time you thought was going to be amazing it was not mm-hmm. amazing you mm-hmm. learned really good lessons from that and now you can identify things going forward and now you've kind of carved out your own avenue and your own direction which personally I hope serves you for the rest of eternity really well yeah Aww. no it, it, it's it's been really great talking to you both as well and just kind of getting like a lot off my chest as well because I think a lot of that like you said PTSD I think there's still yeah. so much pent up like anger in there still like how I dealt with that for so long and didn't do anything about it and obviously if I were to go back I would do everything dif- not everything differently because I think toxic workplaces maybe are inevitable I know that sounds a bit Mm, no I think they're abundant so I feel like everyone's gonna walk into one at some point in their life unknowingly exactly yeah and I think like even if a company does kind of focus on health and well-being I think things can still turn sour in a way because everyone's uh, um, everyone's definition of health and wellness is going to be different so I think even you know even that can be toxic like especially if you work at the say goop or something and they get you to do these uh deep like these juice diets all the time like that is toxic right and that's a health and wellness company so I think it's yeah I think it's, it's inevitable and it's about just figuring out what optimum health and wellness looks like for you and kind of just focusing on that and managing stress in in a healthy way yeah of course I was also going to say I have a few tips as well Uh, yes we want Um, tips yeah like just a few healthy tips I think for handling stress because back you know like I said when I was in my toxic workplace I didn't really handle it in a very healthy way I did drink a lot I did emotionally eat and I did party and they kind of you know everything kind of just accumulated to my downfall, sure. my down, even though, yeah, not that much of a downfall. Um, so if I were to go back, obviously, I would just do things more in a healthy way. So I guess my number one tip is to build a, a morning routine that works for you. I know it's kind of like a buzzword at the minute on social media, but it doesn't obviously have to look like waking up at 5 a.m. and doing like a whole gym routine workout and then drinking Mark, your green juice Mark and doing... Wahlberg skincare routine um he's like I wake I up at 3 30 I pray on like like rosary I beads see, yeah. I kneel on them for, for like the ultimate mea culpa then I go work out like for three hours then I come you know back I mean? pray more then I work out again for two hours like, that shut just up, sounds Mark like Walker. a full-time yeah sounds like a full-time <laughs> job in itself yeah um so I mean this could just be like you know wake up half an hour early and just do something that you enjoy that brings you joy um as well so it could be reading kind of just getting outside for some fresh air or drinking a cup of coffee outside kind of just having like a mindful moment for yourself because when I was working I definitely didn't have a morning routine I used to wake up with just like no time to spare I would get up rush get ready and then rush to the tube to get to work and it was always delayed so I'd literally be late all the time and by the time I got to my desk I had to skip breakfast and I was already groggy myself um so that was my toxic trait as well just kind of not leaving any time for myself in the morning so a yeah morning routine is just a really nice way to kind of de-stress you before the day has even done um begun so you can um navigate it more mindfully um and also yeah on your days off do something more meaningful and worthwhile with your downtime so instead of wasting the day maybe in bed dreading to go back into work after the weekend and watching tv mindlessly kind of learn a new skill or a hobby something that kind of makes you look forward to waking up in a way like oh I'm gonna do this today um rather than oh I you know I've got nothing to do today so I'm just going to wollow in bed and think about work so that's yeah, so amazing just do, to wallow yeah, in like, bed. but yes I also agree that doing meaningful things 
is a way to recharge your batteries exactly yeah which is all rest in a way like even you know getting to if you can at least seven hours of sleep a night I know it's not always you know easy to get that but it is kind of just for me now um, with my business, I mean, even back then I should have done it, but it's about scheduling in your non-work priorities first before you schedule in your work priorities because mm -hmm. when you are busy and you do have a jam-packed schedule, your self-care and your rest and like pr prioritizing yourself is the first thing to like get bugged down the end of the list, right? Because for some reason we still don't put ourselves first. So Please, I don't even know who that is. Where, where, <laughs> where, what's even happening there? Please, please. So... I think with a lot of what I talk about, it's like, it doesn't have to be a whole day dedicated to self-care. It can literally just be like a five, quick three, five minute break to kind of recharge um, in a way. And like, you know, just have like a moment to yourself where you're just doing absolutely nothing. My favorite thing yeah. at the minute is people people watching because I find people extremely fascinating. Especially you're also um, in Thailand, people watching in Thailand. Yeah, in Thailand. High quality it's people amazing. watching. It's so good because it's like a different culture. And it's just like, but thank you so much. Please um, tell everyone where they can find you and we'll put it in the show notes and we'll link it. And if you are okay with it, if you have IG, we'll connect you on IG. And so for more realistic wellness tips and self-care ideas, you can find me on Instagram, Pinterest and TikTok all under at Notes by Thalia. For an insight into my own wellness journey and everything in between, head over to my blog, notesbythalia.com. And for a moment of calm, straight to your inbox every Wednesday, you can sign up for my newsletter at notesbythalia.com forward slash subscribe. Thank you for joining us today. If you would like to share your story, we would love to hear from you. Also, leaving a review helps us create more content because it shows us there's an interest in this topic. For those of our listeners who do better with reading, we have closed caption available on YouTube. See you next week. Same time and same place.